And we're back. And this video, we're going to show you how to solve classic problem number two. Classic problem number two is a projectile motion problem. And it involves an object launched at an angle from the ground and landing on the ground. And um, so let's draw a little picture of that. Uh, I'm going to switch my black pens up. This one seems to be running out of ink. Uh, we're going to have a ground level right here. And let's just uh, be concrete about this. Uh, let's pretend we're going to kick a soccer ball. So we're going to kick the soccer ball at 25 meters per second at an angle 50 degrees above the horizon. This might happen if you um, if you're a defending soccer player and uh, the opposing team comes at you. A couple of a couple of players passing the ball back and forth, and the ball gets ahead of them. So you rush forward and you kick it, and you need to kick it up over those attacking players, and hopefully uh, it'll land somewhere uh, in the field that your team can now take possession. So this is the path that the projectile will follow: a parabola, and it will land over here. I'm interested in knowing how far away this projectile lands from where it was kicked. I want to make sure that's still inside the soccer field, but I want to make sure it's far enough that I've done some good in terms of uh, clearing the ball out of my defensive area. But before I do any of that, I want you to notice something. This red dotted path is below this arrow. This arrow represents the initial velocity, but immediately upon leaving your foot, Gravity pulls the ball below the intended line of aim. And so the trajectory is always below the original velocity. Do not draw the dotted line as coming out from the end of this arrow, because that would indicate that it travels straight for a little while and then bends because of gravity. No, no, no. It bends because of gravity immediately, and this tra trajectory is below the intended path. This kind of thing can help you with sports a lot. If you're trying to shoot a basket, you do not aim at the rim. You actually aim at the top of the backboard or sometimes even a little above, depending on how you throw the ball and where you are. That way, the gravity pulls the basketball below your intended line of aim into the, um, into the rim. So uh, also works for throwing trash in a trash can. The last thing we need to put on this drawing for it to be a cool classic drawing is we need to put our coordinate system. The origin has to be where the ball starts. Positive will be up in this case, and positive will be to the right. Um, our agreement to always have the origin where the object starts is what makes the list of knowns and unknowns uh, shorter. So it's only nine things. Now, this is classic number two, and I said that it, when I, we did classic number one, that there was this extra step. We have components we have to, to deal with. And, um, and that's clear to see because our initial velocity is given to us as a polar vector with r the magnitude, and theta, the direction, indicated overtly. We need to turn this r and theta vector into an x and y vector, because our list of knowns and unknowns has vix and viy, not vir and vi theta. So we need to do this conversion. Our original vector is 25 comma 50 degrees, and we need to turn that into x and y. Now to do that, we have this recipe where uh, x is always r cos theta and y is always r sine theta. And so in this case, that's 25 cos 50 degrees, comma, 25 sine 50 degrees. And if you put these into your calculator, you will discover that 25 cos 50 is 16 and this is meters per second because the original 25 was meters per second. And this one is 19 meters per second. So there we go. We've now done the extra step of componentizing the initial velocity, which was given to us as a polar vector, into an x and a y. So kicking a soccer ball at 25 meters per second, 50 degrees above the horizon, means that you're giving it 16 meters per second worth of horizontal motion and simultaneously 19 meters per second of up and down motion, or upwards in this case. Now we can fill out the list of knowns and unknowns. I was using red before, and I've got the red pen in my hand. What the heck? First level of knowns and unknowns is x and y. Do we know where the soccer ball will be at the end of the problem in the horizontal direction? And the answer is no. That's what we're looking for. Do we know where the soccer ball will be in the vertical direction at the end of the problem? And the answer is yes. You see, the problem is over when the soccer ball returns to the ground, and the ground is zero. Excellent. Next level, vix and viy. 
And these two numbers, the initial velocity in the x and y direction, are what we were doing over here with this componentizing. So these go in here, 16 meters per second and 19 meters per second. Next level, the final velocities in x and y. And as we said in classic problem number one, you might have a question mark here, uh, but we do know because there's no acceleration, this velocity stays constant during the whole problem. So we can fill this part in pretty quickly. Whatever this number is, that number is, and this is a zero. In most cases, I have solved one projectile motion problem in my life where there was an acceleration in the x direction. That would occur if there were, if you were including air resistance or there was a wind, or in this particular problem, there was a very big mountain uh, next to uh, somebody doing a projectile problem. Okay, uh, VFY, we just don't know. We're going to do something with that later. And acceleration in the y direction, because the next level is acceleration, is going to be negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Again, gravity is doing the accelerating in the y direction, so 9.8 is the number. But negative in this case, because of my choice of coordinate system, I chose up to be positive, which is why this was a positive 19. Therefore, this is a negative 9.8. So that what's going to happen is this acceleration is going to reduce this number, reduce it down to zero by the time we get to the top, and then this acceleration is going to create a negative velocity. So whatever is true about this final velocity in y, it is going to be a negative number. And time we don't seem to know here. So there is the list of knowns and unknowns. And now we do the same steps that we did before. Um, as I recall, it was a y Swiss Army equation to find the time. Let's get these numbers. 0 comes in here for y. VIY is 19, and that's multiplying t. Uh, we don't know what t is, so we leave it as t. And then we have 1 half of 9 point, negative 9.8 times t squared. Uh, I, I can multiply this out and clean this up a little bit. 19t, all this is the same, minus half of 9.8 is 4.9 t squared. And now I'm kind of stuck. This is a quadratic uh, equation, and to solve it you need the quadratic formula. Um, and that's kind of a, a bit of a pain in the bottom, but there is a trick I can pull. I can't factor this in any meaningful way, but I can do something on this paper that you cannot do in an algebra class. I can divide through by t. Now, in an algebra class, you are not allowed to divide through by uh, the unknown. You're not allowed to divide by the unknown in algebra class, because what if the unknown is 0? You don't know. So dividing by 0, of course, breaks math, and so you, you can't divide by the unknown. But you can in a physics class, because this unknown is t, which stands for time. And we know that regardless of how poorly this soccer ball is kicked, it will take some time to go. We know that t is not negative, and we know that t is not 0. Therefore, we can divide through by it. Dividing 0 by t leaves you with 0. Dividing 19t by t leaves you with 19. And dividing 4.9t squared by t leaves you with 4.9t. And now I don't need the quadratic formula anymore. Happy birthday to me. 4.9t equals 19 is how I would do that. I'd move this to the other side, making it a positive. And t would be 19 divided by 4.9, which turns out to be 3.88 seconds. Is this a reasonable amount of time to have kicked a soccer ball? I think so, too. A soccer ball kicked in the air probably takes about four seconds to get where it's going. All right, the next thing we did is we used the x equation, and I'm going to move over here to do that, just trying to utilize my paper correctly. Um, x equals vix times t plus one-half ax t squared. Now, I've got to warn you that some textbooks and some solved examples that you'll look at, they'll just leave this term off. They'll write this as the Swiss Army equation. And yes, that's going to happen, but I find that it's not good for kids who are learning physics to leave this term off. Write it down, but then show that it goes to zero. Okay? So x, we don't know what it is, so we leave it as x. Vix is 16. The time is known to us. Oh, that's right, I could put it over here, couldn't I? 3.88 seconds is 3.88. And as mentioned in classic problem number one, this entire term goes to zero because ax 
which is being multiplied by all these other things, is zero. I believe that turns out to be 62, at least it did yesterday. 16 times 3.88 equals 62 meters. Well, I think if I kicked a soccer ball 62 meters, I would be a hero. Okay, first of all, the soccer field pitch is about 100 meters long, so this is less than the whole field, so I have not kicked it out of the field. But this is a significant fraction of the field. This is a little more than half the field, so I've gone from a place that might be just about 15 meters in front of my own goal, and I have kicked it over the midfield line and into their territory, where upon my players can maybe perhaps turn it into a scoring opportunity. So now we know that this is 62 meters. We can put this up here. And like we did with the classic number one, there is this unknown VFY. And it's kind of fun to show you what happens with VFY. Uh, let's see, I used green last time. So let's do that. Let's go right here and let's find out what VFY is using the definition of acceleration equation. So VFY is going to be 19, that's VIY, plus negative 9.8 times 3.88. So 9.8 times 3.88 equals 38. So that is going to be equal to 19 minus 38, which is minus 19. Now that's very interesting. Minus 19. It goes from positive 19 to minus 19 meters per second. Oh, that's kind of interesting. That's because this is a symmetrical path. And whatever velocity it had going up at the beginning, it will have the same velocity coming down at the end. You want to know what's really interesting about that is if you put that back together the way we did before with our 16 meter per second x velocity and our new downwards 19 meters per second vertical velocity, you will find that the resultant is exactly 25 meters per second at an angle that is 50 degrees below the horizon. The same angle that we launched it at above the horizon is the angle it lands at below the horizon. And you can see that if you watch uh, track and field events like the javelin, because the javelin sticks into the ground um, at the angle. Um, give or take, by the way, all of this involves ignoring air resistance, and of course air resistance is a factor in real life. But when you ignore air resistance, you get most of the result correct, and it's really good for learning purposes to, to strip away some of the complexities. Um, I can imagine that uh, ancient uh, warriors, uh, if an arrow landed in the ground next to them because they were being shot at by archers who were pretty far away, um, they might be able to actually kind of think about how far away the uh, archers were based on that angle. And then they would know where to look or, you know, hide from or point their shields, something like that. This is kind of fun. There is one more thing we could do. Now, this is pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty artsy here. Um, we've, we've dealt with the entire trajectory. But there's this point at the top that is very, very interesting. So let's, let's uh, do a, a second. Uh, I'm going to keep this paper handy. We might need to refer to it. Let's do a second drawing here. And let's talk about what happens at the top of the trajectory. So if we don't let the entire movie of the event play out, but we stop it exactly halfway through, the soccer ball or projectile will be at the top of its trajectory. And we could say some things about that. First of all, we could try to say, hey, exactly how high is this thing above the ground? What is the maximum height that this projectile attains? And we might also ask, hey, how fast is this projectile going? And we might ask, when? When does this happen? The time for halfway. Well, I'm here to tell you that this is really easy to solve for. And the reason why is that uh, there are some things that are true. At the peak of the trajectory, the vertical velocity is equal to zero. That is the moment when gravity has removed the initial vertical velocity, that 19, down to zero, and it stops going up, but it has not yet come down. That is the highest it will ever get. It also turns out that this time is half the time, so half of 3.88. 
So let's try to see if we can find the height. And what we're going to do is we're going to use a modified list of knowns and unknowns. Oh, by the way, the distance would be half of the distance as well, but let's pretend we don't know it. Now we don't know y. We know vix is 16, so is vfx. We know that ax is 0. We know that viy is 19. We know that vfy is 0. Remember, our new final position is at the apex of the trajectory. We know that our acceleration is still negative 9.8. And we know the time is that half, but uh, we can actually solve it without knowing the time. Um, if we don't know the time and we're looking for this, we need to use the no time equation. The no time equation is the one that says VFY squared equals VIY squared plus 2 times AY times Y. This is a, a commercial for Y subscripts. It's important to make them small and low. So you don't think that this is a y times a y and put y in there twice. So vfy squared is 0 squared. And this is 19 squared. And this is plus 2 times negative 9.8 times our variable y, the thing we're looking for. y will turn out to be h, the height. 0 equals 19 squared, 361 minus 19.6y. Twice 9.8 is 19.6. Look, folks, I have half of 9.8 and twice 9.8 memorized because I'm a physicist and I do this all the time. You might need to use a calculator. All right, I'm going to move this to the other side so that 19.6y is equal to 361. And now it's pretty clear that I need to take 361 and divide by 19.6 to get my maximum height. 361 divided by 19.6 equals 18.4. So that's not bad. 18.4 meters high. That's uh, that's a two, almost two PACs high. That's a pretty high kick. I did kick it high in the air. In fact, uh, this comes up a little bit. Um, uh, you may know that the uh, Dallas Cowboys built a new stadium a, a little while ago, and they had a giant jumbotron hanging in the center of the uh, over the center of the field so that the people in the stands could watch replays and whatnot. And the punters were kicking punts that would bounce off of the jumbotron because they, they didn't put the jumbotron quite as high as they should have. Um, that's kind of fun. So maximum altitude is attained at half the distance, half the time, where the velocity in the y direction is zero. And then that lets you solve for what the height is by, by, by making that the end of the problem. Uh, another interesting fact is because the y velocity is zero, the x velocity is the 16 meters per second. And that's the only velocity at that point. So it was kicked at 25. Its lowest velocity is 16, which is purely horizontal at the top. And then it gets back to 25 when it lands on the ground again. All right, that's enough uh, for classic problem number two. If you can do classic problem number one and classic problem number two, um, then everything else is a variation or combination of those.